Hello everyone. Today we will be starting with the first seminar in series on periodontics. Chemical plaque control has gained a lot of interest as an adjunct to mechanical plaque control. One such agent that we will be discussing today is the chlorhexidine. A little bit on the historical aspect of it. Chlorhexidine was developed in 1954 by Imperial Chemical Industries in England as an antiseptic for skin wounds. Later on, it found its application in medicine, surgery, obstetrics, gynecology, neurology, you name it. The use in dentistry was initially for pre-surgical disinfection of the mouth and in endodontics. It was first investigated by Schroeder in 1969, but the first definitive study was performed by Low and Schuth in 1970 wherein they saw that rinsing for 60 seconds twice per day with 10 ml 0.2% chlorhexidine gluconate in the absence of normal tooth cleaning prevented the plaque from regrowing and also prevented the development of gingivitis. Quite an achievement, isn't it? It is available in three forms. So we have the digluconate, acetate and hydrochloride. Digluconate is by far the most commonly used one and along with acetate it is water soluble. Hydrochloride is sparingly water soluble. Now this particular agent has set a benchmark for the comparison of other topical supratingival anti-plaque agents. It has also set a gold standard in chemical plaque control. So now what makes chlorhexidine so special? Let's find out. It is active against both gram-positive and gram-negative strains as well as fungi. It has bacteriostatic and bactericidal actions, which we will be discussing further. This is the structure of chlorhexidine. So if you see, it's a very symmetrical molecule. And there are three things you need to remember here. It is composed of four chlorophenyl rings, two begonide groups, hence the term bisbegonide and there is a central hexamethylene bridge. This bridge connects the chlorophenyl rings to the begonide groups. Now chlorhexidine shows two actions. It has antibacterial activity and anti-plaque activity. Now the cationic chlorhexidine is attracted towards the negatively charged bacterial cell wall. It adsorbs onto the phosphate containing compounds present in the cell wall, altering the integrity of the cell wall. And it also shows anti-plaque activity. Now to remember this, understand that for plaque to form, there should be a pellicle that is formed. The bacteria should bind to the tooth surface and there should be acid production. So what chlorhexidine does is that it inhibits pellicle formation by blocking the acidic salivary glycoproteins. It also binds to the bacterial cell wall and prevents its adsorption onto the tooth surface. And it also inhibits acid production in the established plaque. It shows different effects at different concentrations. At low concentrations, it is bacteriostatic, whereas at higher concentrations, it is bactericidal. At low concentration, this agent is bacteriostatic. By bacteriostatic, we mean that the agent prevents the growth of bacteria. Now this is the negatively charged bacterium. When you rinse your mouth with chlorhexidin, the positively charged chlorhexidin molecules are attached to the negatively charged bacteria. This brings about two actions. One, it targets the bacterial cell wall that is it adsorbs on to the phosphate containing compounds present in the bacterial cell wall altering the integrity of the bacterial cell membrane and second it is also attracted towards the inner cell membrane now this inner cell membrane contains phospholipids so when it binds to the inner cell membrane it increases the permeability of this membrane which causes leakage of the low molecular weight components such as potassium ions. So chlorhexidin molecule targets two things, one the bacterial cell wall and second the inner cell membrane. And by this way, 
it inhibits the growth of bacteria. Now this action is reversible. At high concentration there is coagulation and precipitation of the phosphate complexes present in the cytoplasm such as ATP and nucleic acids. This causes cell death and this effect is irreversible. So at high concentration chlorhexidin becomes bactericidal. Now this is an interesting terminology known as the pincushion effect. So we know that chlorhexidin is dicatinic that is it has two positively charged ions. Now this molecule attaches to the pellicle on the tooth surface by one cation and the other one is free to interact with the bacteria attempting to colonize the tooth surface. This prolongs the action of chlorhexidin. This is called as the pincushion effect. Now this mechanism explains why anionic substances such as sodium lauryl sulfate based toothpaste decrease the plaque inhibition of chlorhexidin if used shortly after rinse with chlorhexidin. So what happens here is the free cation interacts with the anionic components of the toothpaste rendering it absolutely useless. Chlorhexidin has a purely topical mode of action be it in the form of a mouth rinse, gel, spray or varnish. It does not penetrate the oral epithelium. So even if by mistake some part of the drug is swallowed, there is no need to worry because the initial binding of the drug will be the mucosal surfaces of the GIT or the gastrointestinal tract. There is no systemic toxicity involved, no microbial resistance and no super infection. It is very poorly absorbed from the GIT. Another important property of chlorhexidin is substantivity. Now this was first described in 1976 by Bonswall et al. The quality of prolonged contact time between a substance and a substrate is known as substantivity. In simple terms it means that there is prolonged therapeutic action even after removal of the agent in this case chlorhexidin and it is influenced by the concentration of the medication, its pH temperature and length of contact of the solution with the oral surfaces. Once you rinse your mouth with chlorhexidin, it binds to different surfaces within the mouth that is the teeth, mucosa, the pellicle and saliva. So these binding sites are saturated with chlorhexidin molecules which are slowly released over a period of time producing a bacteriostatic milieu. So the substantivity period of chlorhexidin is around 12 hours. If you recall earlier we said chlorhexidin is a gold standard in chemical plaque control. So why has it dominated the chemical plaque control industry? Superior degree of persistence at the tooth surface that is its superior persistence of antibacterial effect at the tooth surface. Does this ring any bells? Yes. Thanks to the property of substantivity, no other mouthwash has come even close to it. Some antiseptics have immediate effect on the oral microorganisms, but once they are spit out, they are removed from the mouth, so the plaque can build up again. But in case of chlorhexidin, owing to the property of substantivity, it remains in the mouth for almost up to 8 to 12 hours. And this is the reason it is a gold standard in chemical plaque control. So let's have a look at the uses of chlorhexidin. Preoperative rinsing during ultrasonic scaling and polishing with high speed instruments. Pre-surgical preparation of periodontal patients. Now in dental operatories whenever ultrasonic scalers or hand pieces are used, aerosols are generated. These aerosols stay in the operatory for quite some time. A number of studies have shown that pre-procedural rinsing with antimicrobial mouthwashes significantly decreases both aerobic and anaerobic bacteria in the aerosols. Post oral surgery including periodontal surgery or root planing. Sometimes dressings or sutures may need to be placed which may be a little problematic with the maintenance of oral hygiene. This is where the mouthwash comes in. Then in patients with jaw fixation where the jaws are immobilized this may compromise the oral hygiene a little bit. So again the mouthwash is to the rescue. Then in medically compromised patients who are predisposed to oral infections, 
mentally and physically handicapped patients. In these cases, praise to prove to be beneficial. High caries risk patients. Chlorhexidine is synergistic with fluorides. So combining chlorhexidine with fluoride rinse is highly beneficial. Recurrent oral ulcerations. Now the mechanism of action is not quite clear here, but it may be related to the reduction in contamination of the ulcers by oral bacteria. Removable and fixed orthodontic appliance wearers. Plaque control gets compromised in the early stages of orthodontic therapy and chlorhexidine can be prescribed for the first 4 to 8 weeks. And lastly we have indentious traumatitis patients. Chlorhexidine is not effective in therapeutic mode. The dentist traumatitis should be treated with specific antifungals and then the chlorhexidine should be used to prevent recurrence. Denture can be sterilized from candida by soaking it in chlorhexidine solutions. One of the most common side effects associated with chlorhexidine is the staining. So if you notice here there is brown discoloration of the tongue, teeth, restorations. So what are the mechanisms of chlorhexidine staining? There may be degradation of chlorhexidine molecule to release parachloranilin or there may, may be precipitation of the anionic dietary chromogens that is present in the tea, coffee and red wine. Denaturation of the components present within the dental pellicle to increase the formation of pigmented sulphides of tin and iron. And then we have the catalysis of, the, of mylar reactions. That is the non-enzymatic browning reaction of the protein and carbohydrate in the acquired pellicle. Other side effects include taste alteration. That is because of the denaturation of the proteins present in the taste buds. Oral mucosal erosion. This is because of the precipitation of the lubricating mucine layer. Then there is increased calculus formation. Wherein the dead microbes use chlorhexidine as an initiator for calculus formation. This is based on the seating mechanism of calculus formation. And then we have unilateral or bilateral parotid swelling wherein there is stenosis of the parotid duct. So if you have noticed, chlorhexidine has a topical mode of action. So it affects the superficial surfaces. Like on the teeth, we can see increased calculus formation and we can see staining. Restorations, we can see calculus formation, we can see staining. Coming to the tongue, there will be taste alteration and there will be the staining. On the oral mucosa, you can see oral mucosal erosions or ulcerations. So this is important. What are the instructions you give to your patients? The patient is asked to keep a gap of about half an hour between using the toothpaste and using the mouthwash. This is because of the binding of the cationic chlorhexidine molecules to the anionic components of the dentifrice. So there is reduction in the activity by decreasing the number of active cationic sites. You remember the pincushion effect? The patients are advised to avoid the intake of tea, coffee, red wine for the duration of the use. Why? This is a mechanism of staining wherein it is postulated that the dietary chromogens may be precipitated causing staining. Chlorhexidine is available in various forms. It is available as a mouth rinse or where we either we give it as a pre-procedural rinse or as a daily rinse. Pre-procedural rinse is given in the dental clinic before any particular procedure is performed. That is to reduce the amount of aerosols in the oral cavity or in the operatory. So use it twice a day, half an hour after brushing and do not eat or drink anything for at least half an hour. So we use 10 ml of 0.2% solution, swish around the mouth for 1 minute and then spit it out. It's also available as a gel form. The gel distribution to the tooth surface is very poor. It is dispensed by a toothbrush or a tray. Then chlorhexidine varnishes are also available, but it is usually used as a prophylaxis against root caries. Then they are also available as a chewing gum. Chlorhexidine containing chewing gums showed significantly lower plaque values 
as compared to xylitol and sorbitol containing chewing gums that is the artificial sweetener containing chewing gums then it is available as a gel or perio chip to be used for subgingival delivery as a local drug delivery agent and also as a spray 0.1% and 0.2% another question usually asked for viva is that we advise gingivitis or periodontitis patients to use a mouthwash as an adjunct to mechanical plaque control but can we give it in case of healing wounds can we use it as an irrigant after flap elevation the one thing to remember here is that chlorhexidine disrupts the migration of fibroblasts and their proliferation if used in cases of bone exposure it may delay healing so if bone is exposed don't use chlorhexidine after surgery when there is complete approximation of the flaps chlorhexidine can be safely given as we saw earlier the efficacy of chlorhexidine was influenced by the temperature so this gave rise to the idea of concept of tempered chlorhexidine 0.2% chlorhexidine solutions were heated to a temperature of 47 degrees centigrade in a temperature regulated water bath and used why the 47 degrees centigrade because literature suggests that this is temperature which is readily tolerable by the oral structures and does not alter the vitality of the pulpal tissues tempered chlorhexidine as a pre procedural rinse could significantly reduce the viable microbial content of dental aerosols and was found to be more effective than non tempered chlorhexidine these are the references used If you have any doubts or suggestions do get back Thank you guys stay tuned for further updates